Okay, hi folks, welcome to another week of off-site learning. We're going to be moving now into our final unit, okay, and into chapter 15. So these are what the notes look like. They are in the Google Classroom. I'm just going to give you a heads up here at the top. It's going to be maybe a little more day-to-day -day this week, just as we're heading into the end here with, you know, time limitations due to off-site learning being a bit different and some just straight-up lost time. Um, there's just a bit of compression happening with the notes and just picking out the big ideas as we go. And so... As I'm kind of working that through that, I'm going to be posting the notes. I know that's probably not as convenient to not be able to just print them all at the beginning, but unfortunately, that's what I kind of got to work with. So I will be posting the notes throughout the week. I'm just letting you know that they might not all be there right now on day one, and you may have to go in the next day to get the next day's notes. Sorry about that. Okay, so we'll start chapter 15 and our final unit. Okay, so for some context right at the top here, let's take a look at what chapter 15 and really all of unit four is actually about. So especially in chapter 15, what we're gonna be looking at is a history of our models of the atom. We're kind of going to look at the last couple hundred years of how we have scientifically thought about the atom. Why are we going to learn all of them? Well, it's important for understanding the scientific method, how it works, right? If, if I just gave you the modern picture of the atom, the one that we currently have, well, that really misses the point of science, right? So our history of the model of the atom is such a good case study on the scientific method. So we're going to look at kind of this pattern of we have a model that explains our observations, right? That we see in our universe. And then we make new observations that maybe disagree with that model or at that that model can't explain, right? We saw that last unit with light and the double slit and then the photoelectric effect. So you've seen this in action, but the, the history of the models of the atom is a really clear picture of that as well. So those new observations are made and we're forced to abandon our old model, okay? And then it's not over, we're not done. Science is never complete. Science is ongoing. If tomorrow we discover something that does not agree with special relativity, either we have to adjust special relativity or we have to throw it out and come up with a new model, right? And so we repeat this forever. Science is never done. Science is never over and it never will be. It's an ongoing process. There's a great quote by Carl Sagan where he says, science is much more a way of thinking than it is a body of knowledge, right? Science is not stuff to know. Science is a way of looking at the world, making observations, and then adjusting our models for understanding. So I want you always in the back of your head as we're going through these models that we're gonna be studying in chapter 15, okay? Always ask yourself, why was this new model necessary? Why did we have to come up with a new model? Don't just take it as, okay, cool, new model, right? No, why did we have to make up that new model? Why did we have to throw the old one out? So what observations told us the current model needed revision and how does this new model address those observations? So we're looking at the first time we really changed our model today. And so essentially since the time of the ancient Greeks, there had been this idea, you could break down matter and break it down and break it down, but eventually, well, you couldn't do that anymore. It was made up of tiniest parts all put together to make larger objects that we can see. And so the word atom actually comes from the Greek atomos, which means indivisible. So the smallest building block of matter. So the first time we really put a name on this idea and call it a model is with a guy named John Dalton. And it's sometimes called the billiard ball model of the atom. So billiard ball, like a pool ball, right? So he essentially said, yeah, atoms are little tiny balls that cannot be broken down further. Solid, homogeneous, indivisible spheres. So if we were thinking of the atom this way for really thousands of years since the ancient Greeks, why does it get to be called Dalton's model? Well, he used it to explain some stuff. So it could explain the conservation of mass, right? If these atoms can't be broken down, then we're safe when we do a chemical experiment to see that, okay, well, they can't be broken. And so the mass of our products will always be equal to the mass of our reactants, right? Mass cannot be created or destroyed. It also explained the law of definite proportions, which is essentially just a way of saying that no matter how much water you have, if you split it up by some method, right, whether it's through electrolysis or whatever, then you will always end up with an eight to one ratio of oxygen to hydrogen in terms of mass, because one oxygen has eight times the mass of two hydrogens. From the periodic table, oxygen has a mass of 16 grams per mole, hydrogen has a mass of one gram per mole. So two of those would be two grams per mole, right? So this explained that the balls weren't going anywhere. They weren't getting split up. They were maybe changing how they were arranged but you weren't doing anything else to them. So it explained that. It also just explained the law of multiple proportions, which is an extension of that idea. So that if you have, so for example, with carbon and oxygen, there's many ways those can bond, but 
probably the two most common are in carbon monoxide, which is CO, and carbon dioxide, which is CO2. And so it was observed that 266 grams of oxygen would be present for every 100 grams of carbon in CO2, but then 133 to 100. So it was always this multiple of 133 for carbon and oxygen. That's essentially just kind of an extension of the law of definite proportions. But all of these are explained by atoms being little balls that can't be divided, right? Makes sense. However, there was a lot it couldn't explain. It couldn't explain why these things bonded. And the big one that actually led to our first model that we're really going to look at is that it couldn't explain these things, these cathode rays. So I'll show you one in action here. A cathode ray tube. We need a high voltage power source, such as this one. We need the Crookes tube, which has a metal cathode, a metal anode, a screen that has been coated with a phosphorescent material that gives off light when struck by electrons, and a bar magnet. As we turn on the screen, we notice that the electrons are emitted from the cathode, and as they strike the fluorescent screen, we're able to see the cathode ray, this stream of electrons illuminated. We can use a magnet to show the deflection of that stream. Here we can see the electrons being deflected by the magnet. The cathode ray moves upward. If we reverse the magnet, we would predict that the beam would be deflected in the opposite direction. And we observe that the beam is deflected downward. So essentially what's happening here, you have two electrodes, right? You have a positive electrode and you have a negative electrode. And we call the positive one an anode and the negative one a cathode. Now you may not like that because you're used to chemistry class where anion is the negative ion and cation is the positive ion. These names come from the fact that an anode would attract anions, right? Negative ions would want to go there. A cathode would attract cations. A positive ion would want to go here to the negative one. So that's where the name comes from. Now, if the voltage is high enough in here, this is a vacuum, so it's completely empty in there. If the voltage is high enough, you can see a mysterious ray, a cathode ray, kind of jumping across and shooting over to the anode. So a mysterious beam was observed. So the properties of these rays are going to end up changing our view of the atom for the first time in a while. Just a reminder of where are we at right now in physics as this is happening, what do we kind of understand? Because you might be thinking, well, we knew about electricity, we knew about all this stuff. How can we not know about the atoms that are part of it? Well, we knew about electricity, you're right, and we knew about charge in general, okay? But the idea that these charges were parts of the atom was not really around yet. Under Dalton's billiard ball model, and really under all models we had had, atoms were indivisible. They were the basic unit of all matter. So these were some of the properties of cathode rays that, that people had documented, okay? So we're just gonna go through them and then we'll say why those are important. So they travel in straight lines. That's being shown here, right? When you make the cathode shaped like this cross here, they end up going straight and making a cross there, right? If they weren't traveling in straight lines, that shape wouldn't be perfectly reproduced over there. So, so the cathode ray would go straight from there to there, right? And straight from there to there, and straight from there to there, and you could line it up perfectly. And so we saw that they were traveling in straight lines. Again, they come from the cathode, which is negatively charged, and they move toward the anode, which is positively charged, which on its own suggests that these things have a charge. And even more than that, it kind of suggests that the charge must be negative, right? If they're leaving the negative cathode and moving towards the positive anode, well, that's what a negative thing would do. When they were put into electric fields, look at those first, they did what a negative charge would do, right? You can see here, this is a negative plate. I know it's kind of small. This is a positive plate. And so what would a negative charge want to do? Well, it would want to go up towards that positive and get away from that negative, right? It would be repelled and attracted up here. So this suggested they were negative. And then they did the same thing in a magnetic field that you would expect a negative charge to do. So review for your hand rules here, right? So try it out. How do we know this is negative? So if we're trying to see if it's negative, pull out your left hand. Thumb, reminder, thumb goes in the direction of motion. So if, the, if they're leaving the negative cathode and going to the positive anode, then your thumb would be pointed like that, right? Along their direction of mo motion. Fingers go in the direction of the magnetic field. So the magnetic field leaves north, enters south. So the magnetic field would be doing this, right? So through the tube, it's kind of going that way. So your fingers should be going that way. 
And then what is your palm showing? Well, the force that it would feel, right? So the force should be kind of, I know it's a weird angle here, but up just like this is doing, okay? So yes, it works with the left hand rule. If you try that with your right hand, you'll get down. So these must be negatively charged, okay? They had energy and momentum. We could observe them in collisions, but most importantly, at least as it relates to the atom, any conducting material will emit cathode rays if the voltage is large enough. So if you make the voltage between the cathode and the anode, you can make any conductor produce these. So what does that kind of suggest about them? Well, it kind of starts to suggest that they're in everything, right? They're already there. If we can make anything do it, then it kind of suggests that those particles are in everything, whatever they are. Okay, so all of those properties have been observed by many physicists, but we're gonna talk about one, J.J. Thompson, because he was the first to take these cathode rays and say, this has something to do with atom. He's also quite well remembered because he did something that hadn't been done yet. He determined the charge to mass ratio of whatever particles were making up these cathode rays. And so he did them by sending them through a perpendicular magnetic field. So unit two stuff, right? When a charged particle enters a perpendicular magnetic field, the always perpendicular magnetic force causes it to move in uniform circular motion. So you can see up here, yes, it's not getting to complete its circle, but it doesn't matter. That, that's still the start of circular motion, right? And so just a refresher, since the centripetal force is the magnetic force, we can set the two expressions for those equal. And with some algebra, you end up with the charge to mass ratio, Q over M. So these are all measurable quantities. The speed you get from a setup, you don't really just time the cathode rays, they go way too fast. You get it from kind of a, a setup step where you find the right speed by balancing magnetic and electric forces so that no deflection occurs. And it turns out that the speed just ends up being the ratio of the electric and magnetic fields. But that's, but that's just so that you're comfortable with the fact that the speed can be determined. Okay. Now, when Thomson did this, he found that the value for the charge to mass ratio for the particle was much larger, about 1800 times larger than had been measured for hydrogen ions. You might be saying to yourself, hang on, ions, I thought that all physicists thought that atoms were indivisible and a hydrogen ion is an atom missing an electron. Well, yes, now we know that, but at the time it was a hydrogen atom that got a charge somehow, right? We just said it was a hydrogen atom with a charge. And since hydrogen is the simplest atom, and since hydrogen is the smallest atom, the simplest thing, right? A hydrogen ion was the smallest thing that could have a charge and therefore had the largest charge to mass ratio of anything we had ever seen before until Thompson got the charge to mass ratio of these cathode rays and saw that it was way bigger. He originally called them cor corpuscles. That name did not stick. Eventually they became known as electrons. So Thompson had discovered the electron. So how does this all relate back to atoms? Well, the key that we talked about already was that since all conductors could be made to produce them, they must be a part of all atoms, right? If they have all spitting them out, then they're all in there already. But we just figured out that they're negative, right? They definitely behave as negative. So if they're in everything and they're negative, but atoms are neutral, right? So if atoms are neutral and they have something negative in them, what do we have to conclude? Well, there's also something positive there, right? to balance it out and make the atom neutral. Now, as we saw, the charge to mass ratio was very large. And so either Q was huge, the charge was huge, or the mass was tiny. Those are the two ways you get a big charge to mass ratio, right? And so that's kind of what Thompson said. He said it's either really charged, really tiny, or some combination of those two things, right? And so when he was deciding which of those things he thought it was, Thompson thought, well, these cathode rays have been shown to easily pass through foil. You can pass cathode rays through some thin foil, no problem. Now, if they're big, if they have a large mass, they probably would collide with the particles in the foil, right? It seems that they're very, very tiny, so they're able to get through the little gaps between the atoms of the foil. So he reasoned, it's not that the charge is huge, it's just that the mass is tiny. He ended up being right about that, of course, as we know. Just as a quick example to think about this, remember, we couldn't just measure the mass, we couldn't just measure the charge. These are tiny little electrons as we know them now, right? So the best we could do was get the charge to mass ratio for now. Let's just go through these and kind of think about it as Thompson would have. So the value of the charge to mass ratio for a cathode ray particle is about 1800 times greater than for a hydrogen ion. So looking at these conclusions, okay, we're trying to see which ones are supported by those observations. So we're kind of doing the scientific method here, right? So the charge on a cathode ray particle is 1800 times greater than the charge on a hydrogen ion. Would that give it a bigger charge to mass ratio by a factor of 1800? Yes, right, Q to M, right? Multiplying Q by 1800, 
that would work. That would make the charge to mass ratio 1800 times bigger. So one works. Okay, the charge on a cathode ray particle, which remember what are cathode ray particles? Now we know them as electrons. Is the charge on a cathode ray particle one eighteen hundredth of the charge on a hydrogen ion? Well, that's not gonna work, right? If we divide Q by 1800, we've made the charge to mass ratio 1800 times smaller, so no. All right, let's see. The mass of a cathode ray particle is 1800 times greater than the mass of a hydrogen ion. Again, let's see. If we multiply the mass by 1800, well, that's the same as what we just did, right? That's not gonna work. That makes the charge to mass ratio 1800 times smaller. Now, is the mass of a cathode ray particle 1 18 hundredth of the mass of a hydrogen ion? So if we divide the mass by 1800, then really that's the same as multiplying this fraction by 1800. And so yes, that does work. So one and four. Just an interesting note here. It doesn't have much bearing on how Thompson would interpret this for the atom. But years later, right, as we saw in unit two, Millikan did his oil drop experiment and he determined the charge of the electron. Remember, he always found that the charge was whole number multiples of that number, E, the elementary charge. So he concluded this was the charge of an electron, right? If something was missing one electron or had an extra one electron, it would have this. If it had two, it would have double this. If it was missing three, it would have triple this, right? But you couldn't ever have half of that. So does that sound familiar now that we've talked a little bit more about quantum theory, right? Charge was quantized. There's a minimum amount of charge you can have equal to one elementary charge. So with the charge to mass ratio from Thompson and the charge from Millikan, we could finally determine the mass of an electron as well. Remember, this was years later, so we didn't do it right away. I just, it's worth kind of noting. So Thompson's data suggested a charge to mass ratio of about 7.75 times 10 to the eight coulombs per gram. Using the charge that Millikan figured out, what's the mass? But so let's see what we would get using Thompson's numbers. So the charge to mass ratio was, be careful there, right? We want coulombs per kilogram, because that's the standard unit. So, okay, so if you had a kilogram of these electrons, yeah, you'd have a lot of charge. A kilogram of pure electrons is a lot of electrons. All right, and we want to know M. So M equals Q over that number. Millikan found Q to be. And so with that, we get 2.06 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. So off by a factor of not quite five, right? Let's work out the percent error here. Okay, so pretty high, but realistically, think about what we're doing here, right? We're measuring the mass of, uh, of an electron, an incredibly tiny mass, times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms, guys. That's 0. 000 000 000 000 30 times until you hit a 9. So even just having times 10 to the right power, pretty impressive still. Give the guy a break. All right, let's finally now take this and say, what did Thompson do with this information, that there were these electrons in every atom, apparently? So now that we know that clearly atoms are made of something, we must reject Dalton's model that atoms were indivisible, okay? So Thompson added electrons to Dalton's model. No longer is the atom indivisible. It is made up of subatomic particles, smaller than atom particles. So Thompson's model was essentially a sphere with electrons embedded in a positive fluid. For this reason, it's sometimes called the plum pudding model, which is a very British dessert. Might help be more helpful for you to think of it as like the chocolate chip cookie model, okay? Because that's essentially what plum pudding is. It's a pudding with plums embedded in it. You can also think of it as a positive cookie with negative chocolate chips, the electrons. Why was the rest of the atom positive? Why did he have to make the cookie part positive? Well, because again, overall, the atom is neutral, right? So something needs to be canceling out those negatives that we now know for sure are there because all materials produce them in a cathode ray setup. Okay. Now, why do you think Thompson made the pudding the positive part and the plums the negative part, not the other way around? Well, the big reason, there's kind of two. The big one is that, remember, the charge to mass ratio was huge and therefore it was reasoned that the mass was tiny, right? And so the positive part, whatever it is, it's gotta be most of the mass of an atom because we know pretty well the masses of atoms at this point. And for the electron to be as small as it is, it doesn't come up with all of the mass of the atom, not even close. And so we, we reason that, well, the big part is positive and then the tiny little things are the negatives. The other big reason is that, remember, these were getting spat out, right? So it kind of made sense for them to be little things that could get popped off as the chocolate chips. If they were the cookie part, well then, how do you spit out the cookie, right? That doesn't really make sense. You just spit out the whole atom if you spit out the cookie. So 
So what did this help us do? It helped explain a lot of the electrical properties of atoms. So like we said, we knew about electricity. We knew about charge in general, but we didn't really know how it related to atoms. What did atoms have to do with this? Why would they allow electricity to flow? Well, now we were saying, okay, there's charges that make up these atoms. So now it makes more sense. If these charges are already there in the atom and we just need to make them move for electricity to happen, well, this works. Thomson's model does a pretty good job of explaining that. There's still a lot that it couldn't explain, as we'll see, and you can probably guess by the fact that this is the first stop on our tour of the models of the atom, but it was able to explain the new observations that rendered Dalton's model obsolete. And so this was adopted as the model of the atom for a while, okay? So I really want you to try this, okay? Think about it. What evidence led to the replacement of Dalton's model with Thompson's model? What experimental observations? And be sure to explain why that says Dalton's model was wrong and then how Thompson's model fixes that. So please do try this on your own. Okay, pause the video and then I'll go ahead and just kind of summarize my thoughts here as well. Okay, so Dalton said, right? And then we observed, well, they don't seem to be because every atom we see can spit out these tiny little electrons. So seems like they're already in everything. Atoms are made of something. So how did Thompson's model fix this? Well, he said, those little negative particles are part of all atoms. They're embedded in there. And with a high enough voltage, they can be made to get sucked out of the chocolate chip cookie. And so atoms are not indivisible. And so the name was caught on by now, right? We weren't going to stop calling them atoms, even though atom means indivisible. So now it's kind of just a fun ironic name. Okay, so that wraps up topic one. Check the agenda or the Google Classroom for some practice questions that go with this stuff.